OK, now it's time to go through the answers to the exercises from meeting five, uh, which I hope you've already looked at. OK, so some of these are possibly a little tricky. Uh, some of them might might cause us to, to wonder a little bit, uh, but we'll try to explain uh, how things should be sorted out. So the first exercise that we've got is about subordinators. And as I said in the lecture part, uh, subordinators and prepositions generally look the same. Generally, very often it's the same word. Uh, so we need to look at the function that it's playing. And in order to do that, we need to look at what's surrounding it. OK, so you'll see that most of these are in, in pairs uh, with the same word being used in both ways. OK, so you can you can guess what the second version is going to be when we look at the first one. OK, so the first example, I'm speaking to you as your friend. OK, this should be a fairly simple example. After the word as, we have your friend. Your friend is a simple noun phrase. OK, uh, there is nothing to suggest that your friend is a separate clause here. It's just a noun phrase. It's linked uh, to the rest of the sentence by as. As is working here as a preposition. OK, as is, is doing what we expect prepositions to do, which is simply linking a noun phrase to the rest of the sentence. However, in the second example, you don't talk as a friend should. OK. So here we've clearly got a friend should. So we've got a subject and we've got a verb. OK, a friend and should. Uh, because of the structure of the sentence, of course, this should is only half of the understood verb form, which is you don't talk as a friend should talk. Right. So this talk is understood uh, as being there in the second verb as well even though we don't actually say it or write it. The point being that we've got a subject, we've got a verb form, so we've clearly got a separate clause. OK, so as in this sense is working as a subordinator, it's linking to clauses. OK, a friend should is not uh, a noun phrase, right? A friend is a noun phrase, but a friend should is a clause, so it's linked with a subordinator. OK. Now, we've got three examples that come up with since. Um, I think that the, the first one is the one that that's, can cause us to, to wonder a little bit, can cause us to think. So we've got, since leaving school, I have lived in France. Now, obviously, leaving the ing form, uh, so we have what looks like a gerund form. So then we wonder, with gerunds, do we consider that to be a verb or do we consider it to be a noun okay um, but here you will notice that you have leaving and then you have school so you have school as an object if school is there as an object then we must treat leading, le leaving sorry as uh, as a verb here um, so this will be the typical uh, non-finite verb form with ing, okay, which means that it is introduced by a subordinator, okay. It would be possible, I think, to to try to argue that leaving school, uh, taking all of that as one sort of noun phrase, something that that everybody does, this this one action, leaving school, uh, you you could argue that. But as we said, gerunds, uh, as you know about gerunds, right? So they are verb forms which sometimes are treated as nouns, they're sometimes not. Uh, but in this type of sentence, we would normally treat this leaving as a non finite verb form, meaning that since is a subordinator. Okay, so there's a difference between since leaving school and say, since 1974 or something like that. Number four, I haven't been home since I got my new job. OK, so here we've clearly got two separate clauses which could be individual sentences. I haven't been home. I got my new job. And they're linked by a subordinator. OK, so we've got finite verbs uh, on both sides. Normal uh, verbal clauses linked with a subordinator. So here since is working as a subordinator for sure. 
And in the last one uh, with since, number five, since the beginning of the year, I haven't been to the cinema. Okay. Even though we've got an ing form in here, we've got the. So the beginning of the year, clearly, if it's with the, it's a noun phrase. Okay, so we've got since plus a noun phrase, therefore since is working as a preposition. Okay, this the beginning of the year, it would be just the same as saying since Friday, since last week, any, any type of noun you want to put in there. The fact that it has a verb, begin, within it, doesn't make any difference here. It's the beginning of the year, so we're, we're talking about it definitely as a noun. Okay, something similar is going to happen with the next uh, two with before. So we've got take two of the tablets before going to bed and then take two more before breakfast tomorrow. Okay, so again, uh, going to bed is going to be treated here as a non-finite verb form. Okay, which means that we've got take two of the tablets in one half and going to bed is the other uh, clause. So before is working as a subordinator. Okay, whereas in the second one, take two more before breakfast tomorrow. Uh, clearly breakfast is uh, a noun form uh, and so for, it's linked with a preposition to the rest of the sentence. So before is a preposition. So in number six, it's a subordinator. In number seven, it's a preposition. <clears throat> Number eight, I can't work in a room with so many people. Okay, so many people, there's no verb form in there. So many people is clearly a noun uh, construction, a nominal construction. So with will be a preposition. Okay, with people chatting, it was impossible to hear. Okay, so here what we've got, we've got the ing form chatting, uh, but we've actually got the also a subject, people chatting. Okay, so... Um, this is very clearly going to be tr treated as a verb form, right? People were doing something, uh, or we don't have a we don't have uh, a time here. We know it's in the past because it, it was impossible to hear. We don't have a time given with the verb chatting, but it's people chatting, so clearly we have subject and verb, which means that with here will be a subordinator. Okay, and the last one ten. I shan't talk to her until she apologizes. Uh, so here we've got, I shan't talk to her, we've got she apologizes, these could be two separate things, so clearly they must be linked with a subordinator. This just reminds me that I was supposed to uh, say something about the verb shall. Uh, shan't, of course, is the, is the, uh, not the uh, negative form of shall, uh, and I did promise that I would say something about that, and I will, I will remember. Uh, I, I will actually do that. Um, yes, but not right now because that's going to just confuse us. Okay, so for the moment we will move on to the second exercise. Okay. Right, so this is, this is really what we want to get at with the whole idea of subordinate clauses and looking at functions. This is for me a very important exercise, so it's uh, if you have trouble with this you really need to, to let me know and we can look at this again. Um, but this is the one that's like, just as it was very important for me that you understood parts of speech, uh, it's also very important that you understand the functions in a sentence, and the functions in a simple sentence are relatively simple to identify. The functions in uh, of subordinate clauses in complex sentences are more difficult uh, but again it shows whether you really understand or not okay so this is this is very important okay um, so I've done there. Okay, never mind. Um, where are we? What is the function of the subordinate clause? So let's. We, we've got subjects. We've got direct objects. We've got indirect objects. We've got subject complements. Object complements are positives. Okay, so these are all things that I talked about uh, during the lecture. So number one, you find the wall disappears suddenly. Okay. So as I said in the lecture, the key thing all the time 
is that you work out what is the main verb and what is the subordinate verb, okay? So what we've got here is we've got verbs find and we've got disappear, or disappears. So the construction of the wall disappears suddenly, that, that, that could work on its own, right? That's uh, just the wall disappears is, is fine on its own. That means it's going to be the subordinate clause, okay? It doesn't need anything. So the other part you find is not playing a role in the clause with disappears because th that clause doesn't need it to play a role. Whereas the clause with you find, right, you find needs something. You can't just say you find, right? That wouldn't make any sense. So when we say you find something, that something is obviously going to be the object of the verb find, right? What you find. You find gold, uh, you find the wall, you find the wall disappears suddenly. All of that, the wall disappears suddenly, that is what you find. So all of that will be the direct object of the verb find. Okay, so the function of the subordinate clause is direct object. Okay. When you have uh, an adverbial like suddenly on the end, it's not always uh, clear to which verb this uh, applies. So it, is it that you find suddenly that the wall disappears or is it that you find that the wall disappears in a sudden way? Um, it's not immediately apparent. You could argue both ways. It doesn't make any difference to this exercise because that would simply depends whether you consider suddenly part of the subordinate clause or part of the main clause, which th there's no way really of knowing. Um, probably it's part of the uh, subordinate clause because to, to say I found something suddenly, well, oh, maybe it's possible. Suddenly disappear sounds more, more plausible, but it doesn't make any difference because all we're asking here is what's the function of the subordinate clause. So whether the subordinate clause is the wall disappears or the wall disappears suddenly, it doesn't make any difference. It's still the direct object, okay? Number two is a sentence which can be understood in two different ways, and then that would make a difference to uh, what the function of the clause is, okay? So this is something we need to be very careful about. So the sentence is, we found the wall covered in ivy, okay? Now, if I said to you, go out and find the wall covered in ivy, and then you came back and said, we found the wall covered in ivy, okay? Then clearly the wall covered in ivy, that was a description, that was a thing, and that would then be the direct object of found, okay? Um, however, that, that wasn't actually what was meant <laughs> originally with this sentence. What this sentence is supposed to say is we found the wall covered in ivy means that we, we, we found that the wall was covered in ivy. Right? We found the wall to be covered in ivy. So we went to look for the wall, and when we got there, we found that it was covered in ivy. Okay, So in that sense, what you've got here is we've got two verbs, found and covered. Okay, And clearly the, 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 the sentence, well, I mean, we found the wall would be okay on its own, right? Um, so the, the same kind of reasoning doesn't quite apply here. But when we look at the sense, so we, we found is the main verb, right? So we've got subjects, we, we've got the main verb found, we've got an object, the wall, but then we've got covered in ivy, okay? Which with the ED form, so it's a, it's a non, uh, we, we've got a uh, past part, non-finite form of, of the verb. So this, is actually a description of the wall. It's a description of the object, which means that covered in ivy, the subordinate clause, is an object complement. Okay, so found in this sense, when we say that you know something seemed to me to be something, yeah, I found the ice cream tasty. Well, this this tasty is a complement. Right? It's a description of the ice cream. So it's the same here. We found the wall covered in ivy. The covered in ivy is a description of the object that we found, so it's an object complement. Okay, I hope that's reasonably clear. Okay, number three, what I remember most is her beautiful eyes. 
Okay. Uh, just to say about this sentence, uh, sometimes people get confused with sentences with, with is uh, or with are. So you might wonder why, is, why, have it, why does it say is and then her beautiful eyes? Well, the point, of course, is that the, the verb must uh, be in alignment with the subject. Okay, uh, And the subject of this verb is is not her beautiful eyes okay her beautiful eyes that's a simple noun phrase which is a complement and the subject is what i remember most right which is a singular form which is why it's what i remember most is okay if you wrote the things i remember most then it would be the things i remember most are but it's not. It's what I remember most. So it's a singular form, so it takes a singular verb. So here, what I remember most, all of that will be the subject of the verb is, okay? And her beautiful eyes are obviously a subject complement, okay? This is quite a common type of construction where you get a, a long subordinate clause which forms the subject. Okay, number four. The truth is that I really liked her. Okay, so now we've got is again, but it's it's slightly different. So we've got the truth is. So the truth is the subject here. Is is the verb. So what do we need? We have a subject. We have the verb to be. Okay. We then have, clearly we have another clause because we've got liked. We've got I liked. Okay. So the subordinate clause here if we've got the truth and we've got is, we need a subject complement, okay? So everything else that I really liked her, that's all going to be the subject complement, okay? All of it is playing the role of the complement. When you have the verb to be, you know that. You need a subject, you need a, a, a verb, and then you need a subject complement because it's is, okay? So that I really liked her, that all of that is the complement uh, that goes with the verb, that goes with the subject, the truth, okay? Number five, the truth that I already knew suddenly dawned on my father, okay? So here, we've got the truth dawned on my father, okay? That's a simple construction. And then we've got this, that I already knew. So of course, I knew, uh, this is another verb form. That I already knew is a description of the truth, okay? Uh, but it's not a description brought about by a verb, so it's not a complement. It's a description just thrown in as extra information. It's in commas like that. You could remove it. So this is an appositive. So appositives, as I said in the lecture part, are the easiest thing to identify because they stand out in this way. Okay. Number six, seeing George again has left me more confident. Okay, so... What do we do? We identify the verbs. So we've got seeing here, but we've also got has left. So we ought to be able to, to tell from looking at this that this is not really a verb, that this is not really a sentence about uh, what I saw. This is a verb about how something has left me more confident. So we've got something has left me something. Uh, and the second something, the more confident, that's clearly just uh, an adjective, um, which is not uh, going to be a clause on its own. Whereas seeing George again, we've got seeing in there. So seeing George again, that will be the subordinate clause. And of course, it, it comes before has left me. Okay, me obviously is, a, is an object here, right? More confident, therefore, will be uh, an object complement. So the subordinate clause, seeing George again, this is the subject. This is the subject of has left, okay? Number seven, I gave the woman who used to be my wife an icy stare, okay? Now it's important to note here that there are no commas. It's not I gave the woman, comma, who used to be my wife, comma, an icy stare, right? Which would be a little different. It's I gave the woman who used to be my wife, right? Which is different, right? Because if you if you put the commas in, it's like you already know 
uh, who this woman is, but then you're being told that she used to be my wife. Whereas uh, in the sentences it's written here with no commas, uh, we're identifying the woman who used to be my wife. That we're not, we don't have a woman that we've already identified. So what we've got, clearly the main verb here is an, I gave somebody something, right? So it's, it's gave, right? So we've got subject is I, gave is the verb, okay? Now, we know that gave will require an object, but we also know that the verb give very often has two objects. It's very often ditransitive, and it should be pretty obvious here that that's what's going on. So it's I gave somebody something. Now, the direct object is the thing which you gave, and that is an icy stare. Okay, I looked at her with this icy look. Which means that what we're missing here is an indirect object. To whom did you give this icy stare? I gave this icy stare to the woman who used to be my wife. Okay, so the woman who used to be my wife, this is a, a nominal clause. It's got a verb in it, who used to be. Okay, but all of that, the woman who used to be my wife, all of that is the indirect object of the main verb, which is gave. Okay, okay. Number eight is another easy one. So Uncle Tom, Captain of the Mary Jane, waved at us. Okay, so here, Captain of the Mary Jane is clearly just, it's a nominal clause. Okay, there's no verb in there. Uh, but again, Uncle Tom waved at us will be fine on its own. Captain of the Mary Jane is just additional information describing Uncle Tom, who's the subject. Therefore, it's an appositive. Okay, that's an easy one. Number nine, I hate the way you ignore everything I say. Now, these are the types of examples where you've got to be, you've got to be kind of strict with yourself and don't get, don't get confused by things. I hate the way you ignore everything I say. This is a sentence about hating something, right? Hate is the main verb, okay? We've also got ignore, we've also got say, okay? But the main thrust of what this sentence is about is about hating. I is the subject. So the basic structure of this sentence is I hate something. Okay. It doesn't matter what that something is. It doesn't matter how long that part of the sentence is. It's I hate something. Hate is a typical monotransitive verb. It takes one direct object. Okay. So the way you ignore everything I say, all of that, Okay. The way you ignore everything I say, all of that is operating as a direct object to the verb hate. Okay, So the subordinate clause here is a direct object of the verb hate. You don't need to get into analyzing the parts of the subordinate clause. We're not going that far. Of course, you can do that, but that's not what we're, we're, we're looking at. All we're looking at at the moment is identifying the main clause verb and then seeing what part the other clause plays. Number 10. I am the man you have been looking for. Okay, so we can immediately identify that the main subject here is I. Okay, of course, you is also a subject of you have been looking for or have been looking for. Um, but clearly, I is the main subject here and am is the main verb. Okay, so what we've actually got, again, to take the most basic structure here is I am something. Okay. So I is a subject, am, we know, verb to be, will be followed by a subject complement, right? So the man you have been looking for, again, it's a nominal phrase, the man you've been looking for, with a verb form inside it, you have been looking. But all of that phrase, the man you have been looking for, is a subject complement, the subject I, the verb am, okay? Okay, so we can see straight away that so long as you identify the main verb, then you can identify the main subject. Sometimes the subject will be the subordinate clause. Uh, sometimes it won't be, but then you, once you've got the main verb, you know that it needs a subject, you know that it normally needs an object, or it sometimes has two objects, and that should help you to work out what the other part is playing, what, what, what part the other part is playing, I can see, put it like that, okay. Okay, let's uh, 
otherwise going to cause me a problem. Okay. Um, if we look at now at, at some nominal clauses, okay. So nominal clauses, obviously, nominal clauses stand in for, for where you would normally expect a noun. So it could be subject, could be object, could be complement. Uh, so obviously nominal clauses, well, basically those four roles, sub, well, five roles if we take objects indirect, objects direct, and two types of complement plus subject. So there are five different roles. So um, there's quite a lot of flexibility there. Okay. So nominal clauses with two infinitives. Okay. What's the function of the two infinitive in the superordinate clause? Okay. So what is the function of this uh this super this two infinitive within the main clause as the superordinate clause is the main clause not the subordinate clause but the main clause okay and then we ask also what is the subject of the two clauses okay so number one i expect to be there this evening okay so clearly we've got expect as our main verb here so what we're saying here is i expect something okay so i is the subject obviously of expect Expect is a normal monotransitive verb, which means that it needs an object. So this whole clause, to be there this evening, that is the direct object of expect. Okay. When we ask what's the subject of the two clauses, so we've got this to be there this evening. Well, clearly that there's no subject given of this verb to be. But clearly this applies to I, right? This is saying I expect that I will be there this evening, okay? It's about the same subject. So we don't need to repeat the subject because the subject is understood as the same person. So this I plays the grammatical role of the subject in both clauses, okay? We don't repeat it. Okay, again with expect, number two, I expect everyone to be there this evening, okay? So again, we've got the same structure. I will be the, the subject of the main clause, and the main verb will be expect. Okay, And again, expect will require an object. right? So everyone to be there this evening will be the object of expect. That's what I expect. What do you expect? I expect everyone to be there this evening. However, this time, we have a different subject given for the verb to be, okay? We're not used to thinking about subjects maybe with, with infinitive forms like this, but the, this, this is uh, the subject which is understood here. What we, who, who do we expect to be there this evening? Well, this, this to be rela relates obviously to everyone, okay? So now we say that everyone is the subject of the uh, two infinitive clause, okay? Number three, okay, I promise you not to be late. Okay, so we should be able to see straight away that uh, the main verb here is promise. Okay, uh, the subject of promise is obviously I. So what we've got here is I promise something. Okay. However, so, so you could say, well, okay, I promise something, so everything else is, is going to be the object. But promise, uh, if you think about it, um, promise is actually uh, usually, very often, well, I don't know, usually, often, it can be, uh, ditransitive, okay, and have two objects. So I promise somebody something, okay, or I promise something to somebody. So promise, uh, generally, even if it's not actually expressed in a ditransitive way, um, maybe this is a little bit philosophical, but uh, I'm not sure that it's possible to give a promise without giving a promise to somebody. So the promise is always somehow ditransitive because it's always somehow given to someone. Okay, so what we've got here actually is, I promise not to be late, not to be late, will be the direct object, and you is the indirect object, right? You is the person to whom I promise. So the uh, two infinitive clause here is not to be late. That's the direct object. 
Okay, but there is actually an indirect object in here as well, which is you. Okay. Okay, number four, the plan is for us all to meet outside at eight. Okay, very simple. This is a, a sentence about the plan. The plan is, the plan is what? The plan is for us all to meet outside at eight. The plan, obviously, uh, is um, the subject of is. Okay. Uh, the subject of to meet is us all. Right, or us, depending on how you want to look at it. But clearly, because we've got the plan and then we've got the verb to be, for us all to meet outside at eight can only be a subject complement, right? After the verb to be, we've got subjects, we've got verb to be, so we need subject complement. Okay. I think I forgot to say that in number three, the subject of not to be late is also uh, I. Yes, that, that it's I who's not going to be late, but that's I think that's quite obvious. Okay. Um, and then number five, the plan for us all to meet outside at eight. Uh, sorry, the, the plan for us all to meet outside was stupid. Okay. So here we've got the structure something was something something was stupid okay so was is clearly the main verb right the other verb uh, is a is an infinitive form here to meet so that's not going to be the main verb the main verb is going to be the the normal finite form was was needs a subject so what is the subject of was well what was stupid well what was stupid was the plan for us all to meet outside so the plan for us all to meet outside that is the subordinate clause, and it plays the role of subject. Okay. Again, obviously, uh, us all is the subject of to meet. And the last one, to speak in public for the first time can be terrifying. Okay. So what we've got here is something can be something. Okay, so again, we've got the verb to be. So to speak in public for the first time, all of that is what is described as being terrifying. So all of that is the subject of the verb form can be. Okay. Now the question is then, what's the subject of to speak in public? Well, this is the whole point of a non-finite form. So the subject of to speak in public for the first time is everybody, anybody, for anybody to speak in public for the first time. Just whoever speaks. Okay, so this subject is, is open. Um, we understand this as meaning all people, or at least all normal people. Uh, so that's why we use the infinitive in this sense, to do something is this, because it's, it's deliberately opening up the subject to be basically anybody you like. 